you turn with me to Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, and our text this evening will be verses 5 through 13. It feels like there's a lot of feedback coming through, and I don't know if that's because of the position of the mic or whatever, but it's a little bit strong. Here are the holy, infallible, inspired, and inerrant words of God. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is uh, in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father... Will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Spirit to them that ask of him? Now, to frame our message this evening, I want to make sure that we uh, make a a razor's edge and not a shotgun blast uh, to our exposition of our text, because it seems to me that Jesus isn't simply addressing the subject of prayer, though he certainly is doing that. What Jesus is doing is teaching his disciples how to pray in a particular situation, and that situation is that of need. And so I want to use uh, the first portion of our text this evening to sort of form an introduction to this very much, this very narrow point of praying in need. And so we pick up our text here in verse 5, and we notice that Jesus gives a parable. And uh, it's important for us to just place our text within the framework of the broader context. And when we do that, we'll notice, first of all, that back in verse 1, Jesus himself is praying. The topic of prayer was relevant to Christ's own instruction because Christ himself was praying according to Luke. It says here, as he was praying in a certain place. It's very interesting, if you were to study the Gospels, you'll know that on several occasions we learn about Christ and his prayer life. And there's a couple of things that we can say about that. Number one, when we find Jesus praying, we typically find him playing, praying either in the early morning hour while it's yet dark or later at night. The second thing that we learn about Jesus and his prayer life is he typically found a place of quiet and of solitude. And I think that's what reflected here in the language of Luke as it says he was praying in a certain place. He was playing, <coughs> praying in a place that was free of distraction. But as Luke goes on to say, when he ceased, one of his disciples came unto him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. So the reason why we have the very instruction which is before us here in Luke chapter 11 is on account of the request of a disciple who is coming to Jesus and saying, John taught his disciples how to pray. Why don't you teach us, your disciples, how to pray? And so Jesus' first response is to give them a form prayer. Indeed, uh, the greatest prayer, in a sense you could say, we have the Lord's Prayer. Jesus responds to the request, teach us how to pray, by giving his disciples a form of prayer perfectly legitimate for any believer to use at any time, the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Notice, as Jesus moves on after giving the form prayer, he provides instruction. 
And first of all, he provides instruction in the form of a parable. And notice the parable begins in verse 5, and really what it is, is a story. And that story is interesting to us as Jesus begins to form it, because he says, suppose you had a friend. Suppose you had a friend. And right there, we're already beginning to to, uh, track with the story and think about it, because it feels applicable to us. Suppose you had a friend. All of us have a friend, a friend of some sort. And And Jesus makes the situation feel a bit absurd or at least uncomfortable because he says, now this friend who you have comes to you at what time? Well, at midnight. He comes at a time which makes it difficult. He comes at midnight and he says to him, friend, give me three loaves. So now we have the prayer request beginning or the teaching about the prayer request Unfold. First of all, the timing of the request is untimely. It's midnight. Second of all, it's specific, isn't it? He doesn't just come and say, give me bread. He says, come and give me, please give me three loaves of bread. And then he gives the reason. The reason is because a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Now, it's fascinating because this man is under cultural, um, <clears throat> under cultural uh, reason to provide for his friend. There's no available 7-Elevens or quick stops or anything in the neighborhood. And yet, in this particular era of history, if a visitor came to your house, the expectation was that there would be a provision of their basic needs. And so he is here in the middle of the night. It's not a lack of foresight. It's not a lack of of being thoughtful and being prepared. The person stops in on him unexpectedly, and now there is the duty of hospitality. And so he seems to have a good reason when he says, I have nothing to set before him. Well, then he becomes urgent. He comes urgent after the response of his friend in verse 7. He says, and he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children with me in bed and I cannot rise and give thee. Now it's even more emphatic in the original. The friend of the friend, the friend of the one who's knocking on the door, basically hears the scenario and the situation and the first words out of his mouth are, don't, don't, not exactly friendly. Not exactly hospitable to his needs. He says, don't. And he provides the reason. The door is shut. My children with me in bed. And I cannot rise and give thee. Actually, the language there in the original is more specific. I'm not able. But this is what sets the stage for the specific point that Jesus wants to speak about when he refers to, or rather as he sets this teaching about prayer before his disciples. He says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he shall arise and give him as he needeth. Now, I think that's very important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's going to come back into play when we think about one of the second aspects of the encouragement to prayer, which is set forth in our text here is that we pray with confidence, knowing we can rely upon God as our Heavenly Father. And because we can rely upon God as our Heavenly Father, we should have the confidence to bring any need to to the Lord, whether it's untimely or urgent or specific or more than we can even ask or think, and have the confidence to believe that God will hear and answer us. And the reason is, based upon the example here in the parable, the story that this friend gives to his neighbor, basically, simply because he's annoyed. But how much more will God give freely and openly because we pray to him as a son to a father? So we get ahead of ourselves, but the point here is that Jesus lays the foundation, he opens the door for us to grasp hold of the specific thought about prayer which he wants to bring before us. He says it's because of his importunity. It's not because of the relationship. 
It's not based out of a filial sense of duty or neighborliness. It's purely because of the man's persistent. And so that leads us into the thought of our text tonight about prayer. This is about praying in a time of need. And Jesus picks up that thought and he carries it forward now as we jump into our text in verse 9. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. And knock, it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks, receive. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Notice the opening words here in verse 9. Jesus says, uh, I say unto you. So in other words, Jesus is very clear about the fact that he's pivoting away from parable. And now he's addressing the disciple who's asked the question. And one of the things that he takes from the story immediately is the imperative of persistence. The verbs in sequence feel forceful. He doesn't just say ask. He does say that. Then he says seek. He doesn't just say that. He adds to it knock. Each one seems to gather force and strength as it moves forward. Ask is to make a basic request. It's not quite yet a demand. It puts the petitioner in a place of humility as they bring a request forward, <clears throat> aware of the inadequacy of their own resources, acknowledging their sense of need. So it's a position of humility. But the next step seems a little bit more forceful because now Jesus adds unto it, don't just ask, seek. How much different is that? How much difference is the force and the strength of the verb between ask and seek? Ask, as we said, is an indication of our own sense and awareness of our insufficiency and our lack <clears throat> and our basic need. But seek adds another layer of intensity because it seems to suggest to us that the thing that we're requesting is so significant and so important to us that we don't just ask and then wait, but now we begin to do something about it. We put, as we might say, <clears throat> feet to our prayers. Seek. It's strenuous. It's urgent. It's diligent. But then the third one, takes it to another level, doesn't it? It's not just that we ask, and it's not just that we put the effort and the diligence into the pursuit of something. It feels now, as we've come to the final verb, knock, that we've really begun to um, press forward in intensity. Now we're knocking. We've come to the place where we know that the resources, the place where the need can be met, and now... Jesus says the disciple is to persist with firmness, urgence, urgency, and repetition. And to all of that now, Jesus adds a promise. I love the way this emerges in the text. He gives the verbs in verse 9, ask, seek, knock, and the explanation for why we are to follow that procedure in verse 10 Four. Now notice the promises unfolding from the hand of Christ. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now the thing that we're to lay hold of here and to grasp as we think about these, um, this motivated sequence of promises is that Every single one of the objects of the verb is a divine action. We may ask, but God has to give. We may seek, but the Lord must illuminate to find. We may knock, but God's the one that opens the door. And this is precisely what Jesus is saying to us. If we would follow this model of prayer, when we find ourselves in, in a moment of need, Jesus says, here is how God has called upon us to seek after him. And when we do, Jesus is saying God stands ready to provide for our need. 
So the first thing that we learn here about praying in times of need is pray with persistence. Pray with persistence. Because when we pray with persistence and genuine faith and sincere faith, God is honored by the heart that truly seeks after him with restless persistence. God loves for us to look at him and to cry out to him as the one whom we are persuaded has the resources to answer when we call. But here is the second thing about praying in times of need, not just persistence, but confidence. I love how Jesus sets this up in the domestic example in verses 11 through 12. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? The domestic relationship is clear. It's one that we're all familiar with. It's just part of the the manner of life, a son and a father. In some ways similar to the parable that Jesus gives, friend to friend, but there's something quite uh, more intimate about the father to the son. There's something more personable. There's something that feels much more reliable. Jesus lays hold of that particular relationship and appeals to it, and he makes a common sense appeal as he says to any father, if your son came to you and asked for something that he needed, if he asked for something to sustain him, if you asked for a piece of bread from your father, what earthly father would in turn respond by giving you a stone? It's inconceivable. He amplifies it and makes it even more absurd in the second example. Or if he asks a fish, will he in the place of a fish give him a serpent? Then how about the final one? If he asks for an egg, he gives him a scorpion which could sting him. You see, the obvious point being made here, what kind of father would do that? The answer is clear. No father in his right mind who loved their child would do that. A sinful earthly father, even at that, will give his child what is good. You see, it's just because of the fact that in normal human relationships, Jesus can count on it that things work this way, that fathers give things to their sons in response to basic requests about essential needs of life, that the natural thing is that an earthly father would give what is being asked for. Jesus sets up the lesser to the greater argument then. He says in verse 13, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? It's precisely because of the force and the strength of the earthly relationship that Jesus can make this argument. And I find this to be a very powerful argument because Jesus really seems to double down on the strength of this particular point. If you being evil. He's not questioning it. He's highlighting it. He's highlighting the nature of the fact that we're sinful and we're depraved and we're selfish. And even in spite of all of that, Jesus says the force and the strength of the natural earthly relationship between the father and son is typically so solid and so sound. Even a sinful father will do what's right. He'll show love. And this is where Jesus begins to really blow his instruction wide open. Because he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, proper gifts, gifts which are appropriate to the quest, 
how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask of him? Now, in a sense, that feels like it comes out of nowhere, right? Did the disciples anywhere in this text ask for the Holy Spirit? Well, I think not. There's no reference to it at all. We learned that Jesus was praying in a, in a quiet place of solitude, as was his, his practice. And we learned that a disciple is coming to him, and he says, well, well, John the Baptist teaches his disciples. Can't you teach us? And Jesus gives a form prayer, and Jesus gives us a, a kind of um, earthly parable here that's, that's interesting. And he makes an argument, but I don't think any of us saw this coming. If you read this for the first time, we would not have been prepared for this, in a sense, because uh, Luke extends, or rather Jesus extends the, the whole teaching about prayer to a whole new level. He's prepared for us to think about the idea of coming to the Heavenly Father with prayer requests about basic earthly needs. But he goes way beyond that. He goes way beyond that to the ultimate need. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? You see, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we ought to think of this as broadly as possible. When we think here of the gift of the Holy Spirit, we need to think of every single spiritual thing that we need. Regenerating grace, redemptive grace, sealing grace, adoptive grace, sanctifying grace, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the Spirit of God who gives power and discipline and soundness of mind. Every single thing we can think of when we think about the Holy Spirit and His operations, His gracious operations within us, Jesus encouraged us to seek from the Heavenly Father through prayer. What an encouragement he provides. And he does it with such a homeliness of style that we're not quite prepared for it. But it reminds us this evening that the Heavenly Father is open uh, to our cries and he's able to meet all that we ask for. I provided a quote for the bulletin uh, for this evening's message, it comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer uh, 26, and the question asks, what does it mean that thou sayest that thou believest in God the Father Almighty? And here is the answer, that the one of nothing made heaven and earth, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is our Father in whom we can trust without doubt will provide us everything necessary for body and soul because he is able to do it, and because he's willing also a faithful father. You see, when we take up the confession of the Apostles' Creed and we confess that we believe in God the Father Almighty, the Catechism is saying that this is one of the things that we're confessing, is that we can trust God without doubt to provide us with everything necessary for body and soul. And the reason we can do that is because he's able. And even more, we can trust that because he's willing on account of being a faithful father. That's precisely what Jesus teaches here in our text in verse 13. He's not just able, he's willing. How much more will he stand ready to give us this grace of the Holy Spirit and all of its abundance because He loves us, because He's our Heavenly Father. You see, there's a great assurance for us this evening in this teaching on prayer, prayer to pray boldly and to pray persistently and to pray confidently because Jesus says we need to seize on the theology of the Heavenly Father. Who is He? He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the one that upholds all things by his eternal counsel and providence. And he is the one who is able to give us all things. And he is the one who is willing 
to give us all things. And the way we go about seeking that is just as Jesus has said here, ask, seek, and knock. Seems like we've never prayed, right? And until we really need to. I'm sure you've all had those moments in life when you felt like you never really prayed until then. It's just because you were so desperate. It was just because the situation was so far beyond your capacity or even human capacity to resolve or to fix that you began to cry out. You see, that's precisely the kind of situation that Jesus envisions here, and that's precisely the kind of situation that Jesus' teaching is designed to address for us. He says, if you would pray persistently, if you would pray boldly, if you would pray confidently, you have every assurance to believe that the Heavenly Father will supply your need. So there's a couple things that we think about by way of application this evening as we finish our message on this text tonight and on the general theme of praying in times of need. And that's, first of all, that I think we can say here that Jesus promises that prayer is the means that we apply ourselves to when we need bodily things. I know that feels just a little bit off kilter when we think about the greater promise in our passage in verse 13, where he says, how much more will the Holy Spirit, will the Father grant the Holy Spirit? But certainly, at one level, Jesus presents this teaching on prayer to address how do we go about seeking provision of our bodily needs. Remember, the parable spotlights the need of bread. And it's not unspiritual to pray for daily bread. Jesus even teaches it here in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. In a time in which so many people are concerned about their daily necessities, this is a deeply comforting text. Because Jesus is saying to us, He's... He's got greater resources than the spike in inflation. He can meet our needs if we cry out, if we ask, if we seek, and if we knock. The second of all, Jesus does clearly teach us there's a promise for prayer when we seek necessary spiritual needs. For the believer, it's an obvious promise here because Jesus is specifically addressing the request of a disciple, one whom we would presume has already put their faith in Jesus Christ, and they have requested instruction on prayer, and so Jesus supplies that instruction. And so I believe every single disciple is being addressed here when Jesus provides us with the encouraging response of verse 13, how much more... Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so if we're lacking in spiritual resources, if we're needing to be refreshed and renewed spiritually, if we're needing faith increased, if we're struggling with doubt and worry and anxiety, if our convictions feel like they're being eroded by the force and the strength and the corruption of sin if we're feeling weak spiritually, well, this text is a great promise to us all because Jesus' words are emphatic. How much more, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so if you're at a dry point spiritually, if you feel like you're at a point in your spiritual walk with the Lord that you feel like you're stalling out you feel feeble and weak and dispirited. There is a profound and powerful promise to you tonight. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to you when you ask of Him? But it's also not just for the believer. It's 
for the unbeliever. J.C. Ryle has an excellent sermon on this text. You might want to Google it up and take a look at it. It's a, it's a great read. It's not terribly long. But at the end of that sermon, he fashions an appeal for the unbeliever based on this text. He fashions an appeal to the unbeliever to seize upon this promise of the Holy Spirit. And he packages up his appeal like this. He argues that because Jesus holds forth such, uh, such a sweeping promise of provision, and there's no qualification here. There's no qualification in verse 13. It simply says, how much more? If you are an evil father and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the heavenly father give the spirit to those who ask? He says, if there's no qualification here, then this is a promise to be proclaimed to all who would seek it in prayer. And so he asks, do you know that you're weak and helpless? Do you know that you can do nothing of yourself? Do you know the power of sin and its despair? And then he answers those questions by saying, if that's you, then ask to be made strong. Knock at the door of mercy and pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that lovely? If you have a friend that doesn't know Jesus and you are in a point when you can enter into conversation with them about Jesus Christ, arm yourself. Arm yourself with those questions. Do you know you're weak and helpless? Do you know you could do nothing of yourself? Do you know the power of sin and its despair? Then you can lead them like this. Ask to be made strong. Knock at the door of mercy. And pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit. You see, this passage just isn't about the increase of the Holy Spirit being given to the disciple and to the believer. There's a good case to be made. It's for the beginning. And that's what we should all long to see in those who don't yet know Jesus Christ. The beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit. And it comes by leading others to see that the Heavenly Father is not like us. He is not evil. He's loving. He is gracious. He is merciful. And so we take whatever faith we have, though it even be the grain of a mustard seed, and we cry out to God. And we can be assured that he gives to all those who ask of him. Father, we thank you for the deep assurance that we have received about you and about prayer from your word. Make us bold and firm in our prayer lives. Make us persistent. Help us to be disciplined. But above all, Lord, help us to seize upon your grace and to remind ourselves about you. Make our prayers strong as we reflect upon Jesus' teaching. How much more shall you, our Heavenly Father, our God who loves us, be ready to hear and to answer our prayers. And Father, as we're persuaded of this grand and gracious truth, may you exhilarate us to faithfulness as we pray in our times of need. As we ask in Jesus' name.